all Native Americans have, share a closer relationship with one another than they all do with any Old World group. In fact, the closest genetically that we have in the Old World would be the Anyu in Japan. Uh, but don't tell the folks in Tokyo that they're not real Japanese. Uh, genetically, they're more closely related to Koreans than they are with Japan. Um, Native Japanese, which are on the, uh, the snow islands to the north most of them. Um, so, you've got people coming in before 12,000. You've got uh, innovation and population growth and spreading out further and further as population increases uh, from the Paleo Indian, which is anything after 12,000 or so, up to about 8,000. Archaic, about 8,000, up until about, well, basically, it depends on the site. Um, by 4,000 years ago, you've got plant husbandry that's sufficient in domestication that you have. There's more cities. You can move any, any place you want. I am not problematic with that. It's up to you. Uh, but basically, uh, the archaic goes up to the birth of Christ, roughly. And it's really site dependent. Sometimes it's a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. It depends on the site. But basically, around one, uh, about the birth of Christ, you have this, uh, this shift in pattern. And so people are in denser populations, not dense like us, but you know, you're talking about going from one or two family groupings, maybe 50, 75 people, into two to 300 people in a grouping. Uh, starting to develop more permanent structures, but not necessarily all your round structures. Uh, that's when you get in the woodlands, and that's when we get the Uh You get into the thousands in some areas. But there again, you go from seasonal into much more permanent, so year-round occupation, when you get closer to about, oh, five, six, seven hundred A.D., in the East Oklahoma anyway. Some areas it's a little bit earlier, some days later. Now, I was mentioning that mound building is a purposeful mound building, not the, the trash heaps, but purposely creating mounds is essentially a way of saying, look at me, I'm in charge, you're not. King on the hill. And every time you have a stable environment which allows for surplus, population growth, elites develop, mound building occurs as a way of controlling behavior. So 4,000 years ago, as we said, Poverty Point in northern Louisiana exists because there is about a 150-year period of stability. Population density, growth, elites, mound building. It collapses, though, because the environment is one of those things that is always changing. There is a stability over the long haul, but in the short runs, it's usually just changing. And there's no way of predicting it, but every elite when the things are going well, says the reason it's going well is because of me. I'm doing all the rituals. I'm coordinating the ignorant farmers because farmers in the eyes of the elites are always ignorant. And then later on, storage facilities, things like that to take you over the bad humps when obviously the reason to, that bad things are happening is because those ignorant farmers did something wrong. And it's up to the elites to figure out how to fix everything. And that's what happens. Now, at around 400 BC, in the Ohio Valley, there was a stability. And it mostly was located in the upper portion of the Ohio Valley. So, eastern Ohio, Pennsylvania, that area, to the south as well. And you have a stability long enough and productive enough to allow for a group called the Adena to exist. It didn't come into our area, but that stability was really fairly localized. And so the mound building that we call effigy mounds, the Dina mounds, are occurring in that area. Centralized authority, centralized population. About, about 200 years almost, it was thriving and then it collapses. The environment collapses and the population gets disgruntled 
and they say check the elites and the mound building stops. Then about the birth of Christ in the Ohio Valley, but lower down mostly, so western Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, even into northeastern Oklahoma a little bit later, you have another stability period and a group that we call the Hopewell develops. Again, stability, population, elites, mound building. These are also effigy mounds. And if you ever go to the Chillicothe area in Ohio, there are the Great Serpent Mound and other mounds that are associated for that period of time. We have a small excursion or a offshoot of the Hopewell in Kansas City. Uh, they don't last very long. They really weren't a main part of it, but they do have some of the same behavior patterns, some of the same ideas, mound building. Uh, although, there are fewer people there at that time. So they don't have as much elite. And so over by Emporia, Kansas, there is a Hopewell site, which has a mound, but instead of being the entire snake, they actually dig a ditch that's the snake, and then in the mouth is an egg, and that's the mound. Uh, so you have a an abbreviated version of what you would have seen in Ohio. Uh, and then that group had a show offshoot that goes into northeastern Oklahoma, into Delaware County. And they have uh, no mounds, but they had some presence. They had uh, some artifacts that came from Ohio and from Kansas City that were coming into that area. It's a frontier zone for them. Anyway, when that collapses about 300 years later, uh, mound building stops for quite a while. Well, temporarily quite a while. Then around 700 AD, we see an incredibly lush period in America's history. Much lusher than it had been, at least as far as we're aware, before or afterwards. Not just more rain, but a much more predictable rainfall pattern from year to year to year. Long growing season. Huge surpluses. And it goes from California to Virginia, from the southern edge of Colorado to northern Mexico. So basically the southern half of the U.S. was experiencing incredible productivity. Now from 700 to about 1100, there's a bump in that that goes through central Kansas to the Great Lakes, down through central Ohio and joins back in. The far northeast and the far northwest never experienced this time of plenty. As a result, they never have the population densities that we started getting in this Mississippi. Now, this does not jump up overnight. This is a generation after generation development and evolving. But eventually, you have hugely dense cities that are being sprung up along major waterways. Because before Europeans come in, remember, there are only two ways of movement. You either walk which is never efficient. I mean, the max you can carry any distance is less than 50 pounds. And that means most of the stuff, you, the further the distance, the less of that's going to be stuff you are training with somebody else. It has to be the stuff you have to carry to get you through from one day to the next. Or, besides feet, short distances foot, but not really preferred, boats, dugouts, rules. The big transport boats ran from 30 to 60 feet long. Some have sails. Some hold up to 80 people or more during the Mississippian period. And almost everybody is located along a waterway in part because of that connectivity, the highways, if you will, for the people of the past. So basically, anywhere from the, the Rocky Mountains or the Panhandle of Texas and west, east, you can get with a lot of stuff and a lot of people by boat all the way to the coast of, of Virginia. <coughs> and you can do it in less than five weeks. You can go anywhere in the eastern U.S. with these big boats with a lot of stuff, a lot of goods, and move people and goods very, very rapidly. And that is key because even if you had a bad year in cropping, if you have this interconnectivity, that means you can still bring enough resources in to sustain a population. 
just like we have semis today. You can do exactly the same thing, only with these big, huge, humongously large trees that they're making into dugouts. And they are all over the place. The reason why Spiro becomes so important in the Arkansas Basin is because right here on the Arkansas, the river cut through a limestone ridge. Most of the Arkansas's run from Leadville down is a very wide, meandering waterway. It moves a lot. But here, because it's pinched down because of that narrowing caused by cutting through that limestone ridge, it meant that the folks who lived here had a toll booth on the I-40 in the past. You can't just pick up one of those 60-foot boats and go over to the Boston Mountains and come back down and avoid paying the tribute here. It also means that when the river goes into flood, the energy is squeezed down to a narrower channel, which means instead of meandering all over the place at this point, the energy squeezes out and the energy, the destructive forces of flooding, go to the north and east, into what we call the pawpaw bottoms. That's where the destruction comes in. This area would have gotten the backwater. It got rain, got water, deposition of soils, rejuvenation of the agricultural soils, but not the destructive scouring effects of flooding that would have occurred. That means you can have a city here for a thousand continuous years with huge surpluses and be able to support that city regardless of what the environment is doing to you, at least mostly, you know, until 1300. We'll talk about that in a bit. So you have this huge surplus, massive population growth. You go to a city that was surrounding us that covered five square miles on both sides of the river had over 10,000 people for over 1,000 continuous years. Farming the river bottoms, living mainly on the terraces. Now, as you have in any community, you've got the regular folks, and then the majority of those are regular folks, and then you have that small enclave that control everything, the rich and famous part of town. Fiona Hills over in Fort Smith. Nichols Hills, or at least originally Nichols Hills, in uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, when I was growing up in Tulsa, Southern Hills used to be it. Now, whether or not there's actually a hill there, because in Nichols Hills, there are no hills, <laughs> but it doesn't matter about the, the label. It's the idea of congruent leadership individuals, people of char in charge. Well, by separating yourself out, you create in the minds of the others, the rest of the population, that these people somehow have more power than everybody else. So just by physically separating the leaders from everybody else, it reinforces that you need to listen to them. Another way of showing up was having homes that, even if they're built like everybody else's home in terms of the materials, a leader's home was two to three times the size of a regular person's house. The city surrounding us, those regular farmers, their homes are built about oh, maybe 10 by 20, uh, so 10 feet by 20 feet long. And those are built to house of an extended family of between 5 to 15 people. We average it at about 10. They're an extended family, and the house itself would have been owned by women. Women are the center of the culture. Most of the time, and this is again different from what you see in TV and movies, but most of Native America is matrifocal before European intrusion. Matra is just a Latin base that means mother. Matrifocal means that you trace your matrilineal, means you trace your line of descent not through the father's side of the family, but through the mother's side. Matrilocal, because when men and women get married, the man moves from a different town into his wife's home. Because the women are the farmers. You're not going to move farmers around. Women are working 8 to 12 hour work days to produce 80 to 85 percent of the diet. They are the economic powerhouses of the Mississippian period. The men are mainly large meat resources, deer, turkey, elk, less than 15 percent of the diet. They're working an average of a three to four hour work day to do that. 
which means the women are doing most of the work. They own almost everything. The men don't own very much, but because they have the time to, to mess with it, they dominate the religious areas of life. That's why when you're looking at the art in the, in the collections area, you're going to see mainly men depicted because it's religious art dominated by the men. The political arena was more or less shared. Both men and women could become major leaders, although by far it tended to be men because, to be honest, the men just had a heck of a lot more time to deal with it. So you've got this big community surrounding this mound site. This is the city center. We have about 150 acres that we control. That includes the 12 mounds, three down here on the bottom, nine on the upper terrace, and a portion of the elite city, which had about 50 households, uh, about 500 folks. And this would be the people who were like the president and Congress. Not just local leaders, the people here control two-thirds of the U.S. from here. This is Washington, D.C., the most powerful single group ever to exist in the United States. So separation, again, is another way of controlling behavior. Now, when you're dealing with the 12 bounds here at the site, there are three different kinds. All the bounds are created for the same basic purpose, to say I'm charged. But there are three kinds of mounds that are created here. All of these mounds are man-made. They are also all accretional, meaning they're not built all at once, but layer upon layer upon layer. So the longer an area is used, the more times it's added to, the bigger and taller it'll become eventually. Most of the mounds, nine of them, are house mounds, created for the primary leader's home to be built upon. But house mounds are accretional, meaning they're built layer upon layer upon layer, but they are also sequential. So although you end up with nine house mounds over an 800-year period, you only had one of them actually have the primary leader's home on it at any one time. The others are either no longer occupied by a building, but are maintained, so they keep that flat top pyramidal shape that they normally build to, or they have yet to be constructed at all. All of these mounds are accretions. So, before 800 AD, there were no mounds at Spira. There were leaders living here. There were houses. There were some burials in the ground at that point in time, actually from 700 through about 800. But there weren't any mounds yet. But about 800 AD, the primary leader's home, the president, if you would, lived in a house that was built on the ground surface, about two to three times the size of a regular person's house. So it's about 20 or 30 foot square. And that's where there's two small house mounds down here to the east, the ward mounds, ward round one, ward mound two. The southern one is where the house was located before the mound existed. So the house was built on the ground surface. It was used until that leader's death, which was about 20 years later. When that leader died, they started doing something here that was also starting in the rest of the Mississippian area at the same time. That when a major leader died, they would then destroy that leader's house by burning it or tearing it down. <coughs> they would then cover over where that old house used to be with a layer of dirt, brought in by the basket load, about a foot to two foot thick. Flatten the top, slope the sides, so it looks like a very small cut off pyramid of dirt. Then the next leader's house is built on top of that small mound. Use that until that person's down. Destroyed it, covered over, built another one on top of it. Layer upon layer upon layer until you end up with maybe three or four construction phases. And it varies from mound to mound, but for some reason they decide that at this level is as tall as it needs to be. So whenever that leader died, they would destroy the home like regular, covered it over like regular, flattened and sloped it like regular, but instead of building the next leader's house on the same spot again, they'd go to a new location and start the process over. Build, use, destroy, cover over for another three or four houses. Then they go to another one and another one and another one. So only one of them actually has an active use of it. But all those that have been used before are still used, just not as a living area. They're used as a memorial. So if you go to Washington, D.C. today, 
you go downtown or actually down in the, the Capitol complex and you'll see buildings built as memoriams. The Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument, Jefferson Memorial. When you see those buildings, who do they remind you of? Past presidents, right? Well, the same thing was happening here. Spiro is the seat of power for the Mississippian peoples. So if you were of any importance a thousand years ago and were, would come for some ceremony during your lifetime, you would have learned that this mound here that is being maintained, so flat top, pyramidal shape, if it starts to erode, they'll cut out the eroded area and pack it full of new material. But they like that same in that you look. So they say, that's where leaders A, B, and C lived, and what they did in their life. And this one, X, Y, and Z, and what they did. We don't know what their names are, but they did. Just like we know Lincoln, Jefferson, Washington. And while you're saying that this is where they are, the, the accomplishments, the foibles perhaps, of those leaders would also be discussed. It constantly is a reminder, visually, of who's in charge and who's not. Even though you're no longer alive, you are still of status, of importance. And it maintains that by using these architectural forms. It also reinforces the fact that leaders come and leaders go. But the system stays the same. So don't mess with it. You're talking about a culture that controls over two-thirds of the U.S. The Mississippian is a confederation that incorporated over 60 different tribes, over 30 different language groups, directly involves over 6 million people, controlling everywhere from the Rockies to the Virginia coast, from the Gulf Coast of Florida to the Great Lakes, and everywhere in between. Huge cities are existing. Cahokia, up in East St. Louis, 50,000 people. It's bigger than any city in Europe at the same period of time. Massive size sites throughout the eastern U.S. that maintain their power and control over vast areas. There are tens of thousands of mound sites created during this period. Because remember, mounds are about who's in charge and who's not. Now most of those tens of thousands of mounds are single mound sites. One mound created for a building and that building would operate like a county seat, control 10, 15, 20 towns around them. In East Oklahoma, Western Arkansas, we've got about 40 of those that are directly tied to Spiro. Closest one would probably be over in Fort Smith on Cavanaugh Road. Uh, here in Oklahoma, north of Kyoto on the Canadian was one. Uh, north of us on Lee Creek is another. But they're scattered around to facilitate, manipulate, control, populations that are in smaller communities. They in turn are controlled by bigger centers which operate like state capitals. We've got about a half a dozen in East Oklahoma, West Arkansas, again tied directly to Spiro. And then they in turn are controlled by the big four, the four regional centers. Spiro, because it controls the Arkansas and the Red River Valleys, controlled the West. Moundville in Alabama controlled the South Central. Etowah, Georgia controls the Southeast. Cahokia in East St. Louis controls the North Central. Now, each of those was autonomous, but interconnected. And Spiro was the glue that held those connections together. They did so in part by creating an ambassadorial network. Folks from Spiro that are stationed st strategically, either in big cities or major resource areas. And then to tie them together, they create the only pan-tribal writing system for the U.S. prehistorically, which is the conch shell engravings you'll see in the exhibits. That iconography or picture writing allowed for them to standardize the basic religious, political, and social ideas for the Mississippian peoples. It's their rough equivalent of the, of the Bible. You can imagine, over 60 different tribes, two-thirds of the U.S., and a loose confederation. But if everybody believed differently about how the world was created, where first fire comes from, or how our ceremony is to be conducted, the chance of holding that system together without violence, without warfare, would be pretty close to zilch. Violent warfare during the Mississippian period is extremely uncommon. I mean, they're human, so there's some, but really very little violence. So your controls have to be social, economic, political, religious, which is why mounds exist. But also, in order to have a commonality between this very diverse and widespread group, 
the leadership here in Spyro create the only pan travel writing system. That iconography allows for us to see how they believe the world was created for Spire. Ceremonies like the bus or green corn, rattlesnake dance, black drink ceremony. We also get to see cosmological stories and heroes and monsters that those heroes have vanquished. Uh, Red Horn, Morning Star, who are heroes. Uh, Dorwena, Yuthana, both Cherokee versions of uh, destroyers, soul stealers. Those are all engraved in the conch shell, sent through messengers to ambassadors that are stationed outside of Spyro to manipulate and behave and connect the rest of the nation together. Those conch shells and the information would be disseminated to those ambassadors. The ambassador then disseminates the information orally, transmitted to the rest of the nation, and then holds on to those items that show status. The more important your position is, the more these things you're going to end up with, and then when you die, your status doesn't end. It continues into the afterlife. Your body and all the things that showed your importance, the conch shell, the copper, the stone, would be brought back here and eventually interred in the one burial mound. Layer upon layer upon layer, over 1,100 liters ended up being buried in the Craig Mound, the burial mound for the site. Along with those 1,100 liters, millions and millions of artifacts. This one site in that one mound is the largest amount of leadership materials found anywhere in the United States. Over 70%, 70 to 75, of all leadership art for the eastern two-thirds of the U.S. is found right here in that mound. Because the people here were in control of most of the United States. And they have the materials that show that status in this life and continues that status in the afterlife. The reason we know what happened in that mound is because in 1933, a local group called themselves the Pacola Mining Company. Neither miners nor really a company. They were just six guys out of work during the Great Depression. Got a hold of the lease on the burial mound. Now, according to them, the original reason why they picked, took out the lease, this is all Choctaw Freedmen allotments. Uh, so the ex-slaves of the Choctaw Nation had cleared and farmed the land since the 1870s. In fact, the family still continued to farm the land up until the 1960s. So they, would, they had been farming it but not disturbing the mounds because they're coming out of the Choctaw tradition. Mississippi and Alabama, um, the Choctaws and the Chickasaws were a part of that Mississippian tradition. They knew what mounds were, but also that these were not their mounds. So they didn't disturb them until 33. The commercial diggers dug into the burial mound because they believed that was where the Spanish gold was going to be hidden. A story told for every county in Oklahoma, almost every county west of the Mississippi, and does not exist in any of them, but it was the Depression. These guys really weren't looking for jobs. There weren't any need anyway. They wanted to strike it rich. So they got a hold of the lease on the burial mound because they wanted to find gold and silver which there wasn't any, which meant the things they were not finding, bones, stacks of cloth, bushel loads of seed pearls, copper, conch shell, you name it, there's more of it here than anywhere else in the U.S., was of no interest to them initially. I mean, they were using some of the bones, <coughs> thousand-year-old cedars, as firewood during the winter of 33 and the spring of 34, until local folks start coming in to see what they found, and not seeing gold or silver, but thousands and thousands of artifacts strewn along the flank of the mound, they said, well, I'll give you a nickel for that, or a dime for that. Well, even in the 30s, that's not much money, but it was enough to keep their families fed. So from 1933 to 35, these six men and their helpers destroyed about a third of the burial mound, about 400 burials. It sold hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of items to collectors, museums, and universities throughout the entire world. Literally, anywhere you go, it is highly likely that there is something from Spyro in a collection nearby. Over 65 public facilities in the U.S. alone we've identified with materials from this site that were mostly sold during the commercial digs. From the Smithsonian to UCLA, University of Chicago to the University of Texas, all over Oklahoma and Arkansas, 
overseas in places like the Louvre, the British Museum, the National Museum in Germany, there's stuff in Yugoslavia, Saudi Arabia, Buenos Aires, Peking, Japan, Taiwan, Korea, little museum outside Jerusalem has stuff. Back in the 30s, when the commercial digs were going on, this was called the King Tut of the West, because nobody before or since has ever seen anything like the material that was coming out of here. Not only the massive amount, but the artistic sophistication far exceeds anywhere else, at least uh, for the most part. There's a piece here, a piece there, but you're talking about hundreds of items in single collection areas, burials, that are just incredible art pieces because that's those people and it's their power, their importance while they're alive and after death. Well, the destruction was so horrendous and the site was so unique that in 1935, Oklahoma becomes one of the very first states in the nation to pass laws to stop that kind of destruction. It finally shut down the commercial digs. But this was still privately owned land. It was still the Depression. There was no way of adequately protecting it, not this far from Oklahoma City. So as a result, in 1936, the University of Oklahoma with help from the Oklahoma Historical Society, the University of Tulsa, and private donors like Frank Phillips of Phillips 66 fame, came in and started scientific excavation of what remained of the burial mound. 738 burials were recovered, millions of artifacts, most of which now are in OU in curatorship for the Wichita and the Caddo, who these folks become parts of. <clears throat> Out of the 73 tribes that end up in Oklahoma, only the Wichita in the Arkansas Valley and the Caddo along the Red are native Oklahoma tribes. All the rest were forced from every corner of the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Of course, before the federal government could force those tribes into Oklahoma, they first forced the Wichita and the Caddo out of Oklahoma into northern Mexico. And then when that becomes Texas, Texas then forces them back in Oklahoma. This is why every one of the 73 tribes end up with their own Trail of Tears story. Because not a single one of them is where they started out at or where they wanted to end up at, including the Wichita and the Caddo, who this site, the folks who lived here and controlled most of the United States, where they came from. The Wichita and the Caddo are still claim this site as a religious site for them. This is a uh, a sacred site for both those two tribes because this is their tie between that past that was taken from them and their future which is still to come. <clears throat> Pardon me. The university also looked at the other eight mounds that they knew of at that time. All of those were tested, all of those still have portions intact, some more, some less. The last three mounds we found just in 1979, during our last re research here, which was from 79 through 82. Well, major research. Those three, one was tested partially in 79 and 80, the other two have been left completely alone and will remain that way. Of the total site, which we control 150 acres, less than 15% has ever been tested. Of the city surrounding us, which covered five square miles or more, less than 1%. There's an enormous amount of work that needs to be done. Unfortunately, since the 80s, Oklahoma, and basically the nation, has been in a very deep depression, and research funds have not been available since that time. Now, we've had a joint project in remote sensing. That means using technology to get an idea of what's going on. It doesn't tell you exactly, but it sends energy into the, into the ground. It measures rebound. So dense areas typically rebound more of the energy, uh, less dense, less. So house floors, which are dense areas, bounce more, and less dense, like post holes, um, pits, burials, will allow more to go through. So we end up with a pattern, what we call an anomaly pattern, which if we ever get more money, we'll be able to go and do some testing on to figure out what those anomaly patterns mean. Now, we were going to have a field season from OU come out last summer, but we all know what happened last summer, COVID. And this summer, it's still here, yeah. so we couldn't have it this summer. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise again, 
-hmm. We'll be able to go and have our field season next year in the summer out here testing some of those anomaly patterns. And that'll be the first major excavation we'll have had uh, other than some minor work that we've done since that in 1982 research that I was involved in. Um, it's an amazing site. There is no other place that gives us a glimpse into the past as well as Spyro does. The art itself is amazing, not just because it's information, but because of the sophistication of the artists. Before Europeans come in, when Native Americans wanted to depict people, they typically do it in an abstract form. Stick figures, exaggerations. But at Spyro, they get that as well, but we also get extremely naturalistic forms. So, how many of y'all have seen the exhibits in the other room? The pipes and stuff. When you're looking at those pipes, and to some extent the shell engravings and the copper work as well, what you're looking at is the original owner of that pipe as they looked a thousand years ago. The Art at Spiral becomes a thousand year old photo album. No other place in the U.S. has that opportunity. We don't have to, as archaeologists, say this is a generic form of what they think we think they look like based upon bone. We get to see what they look like. Not only do we get to see them, we get to see their faces, we get to see their bodies, we get to see their clothing, their stylistics. Things that just decay rapidly, like body tattooing and face painting, hairstyles, those things are preserved in the art and spiro. <coughs> and to some extent, some of those perishables are preserved here as well. More fabric is preserved at Spyro than any other site in the U.S., including what Arlene is showing us is the lace from Spyro, the uh, bottom lace. They also have more basketry preserved here than any other site in the nation. Basically everything. There's more of it here. And we get that photo album on top of it. So we're not just talking about the generic culture. We're talking about them. We know what they believe. We know what they look like. We know what clothing they wore. The ceremonies they produced and, produced and participated in. Not as a cultural... This is what we think. But what they show us, it is so different than any other place in the nation. And is why Spyro is so important, not only to Oklahoma, but for everybody in the eastern two-thirds of the U.S. And especially because when Europeans come in, the cultures are so different. Before 1492... We have over 30 million people just in North America. All of Europe at the same time has about 23 million people. So there were more people before 1492 just in North America than all of Europe. But by 1800, less than half a million Native Americans still survived in the U.S. By 1900, it's closer to a quarter of a million. That massive decimation occurs over and over and over again after that initial contact, primarily because of European disease. Europe, Asia, and Africa have over 10,000 years of nasty diseases incubating through their populace. The New World had no epidemics until Europeans come in. And the reason for that difference is because for 10,000 years, Europe, Asia, and Africa have nasty diseases because they have 10,000 years of domesticated animal usage. Almost every nasty disease out there, past, present, and most likely future as well, is usually a mutation of a domesticated animal disease. Hmm. Influenza, the flu, is almost always a mutated chicken or pig disease. But cows, pigs, chickens, horses, sheep, goats, geese, it does not matter if it's in dense populations next to humans, they the chance of transmutation, jumping from one species to another, becomes very high. The world had almost no domesticated animals. Here in the U.S., the only real domesticate was the dog, which is a universal and has one of the lowest migrations of their diseases into human virulent form. 
they were in the process of domesticating turkeys, but it was a long way, way from being in dense enough populations to, to affect uh, these, these disease rampant things. Elsewhere in the New World, you have turkeys, llamas, alpacas, guinea pigs. Uh, guinea pigs, the Inca referred to as kind of the hot dog on the hoof. Uh, that's why they were bred, they're cotty. And uh, of course, our guinea pigs are mostly small critters that are, still have all the annoying habits of uh, the cavi that the Inca had. But if you go down to La Paz today, the street vendors have these little hibachis set up and they have cavi, guinea pigs, on skewers. Just like uh, going down to the fair and having a turkey leg or having a skewer of alligator tail. It's the same thing. Um, but they're never in that dense enough population to make possible this transmutation to take place. So when Europeans come in, they have 10,000 years of nasty diseases incubating through their populace. The New World had zero, no immunities, none. Which meant when they come into contact with one another, the disease runs absolutely rampant. When the Soto lands in Florida in 1539, his is the first to go through the southeast from 39 to 42, finally dying in southern Arkansas in 42. But even before his four to 700 guys leave the coast of Florida into the interior where the big cities were, cities of 10,000 or more are down to 100 people or less. One year. And another couple of years, another disease profile, and another 90% die. Over and over and over again. Now, granted in the 15, 16, even in the 1700s, Europeans did not know what disease was. They didn't have microscopes. But they very quickly understood the effects. I mean, take out 90% of the people and never even fire a shot. And so as new strains of rubella, smallpox, plague, whatever, went through the port cities of Europe, they would buy up the goods from those households that had been stricken, ship them over in quarantine ships. They usually flew a black flag or a black sail. And then they would target specific groups that they wanted to eradicate. Mm -hmm. The American government continues that as a subjugation policy at least as late as 1872. It may continue longer, but that's the longest we have a paper trail that says this is a deliberate act of genocide, which is also why we don't talk about it. We expect every other country in the world to talk about their genocidal past. We're much more reticent about talking about our own. We'd much rather talk about myths, like manifest destiny and bringing civilization to the savages, as opposed to the reality, which was, had it not been for both accidental and purposeful introduction of disease, it physically would have been impossible for Europe to conquer the New World. They didn't have anywhere near enough people until you knock out 90% of your opposition. Mm -hmm. In all of the New World, and it varies depending upon who you read, but basically about 110 million people in North, Central, and South America before 1492. Mm -hmm. Dramatically different. About 10% of that is what's left by 1800. Mm -hmm. It's a dramatic difference. Native American populations still have a greater susceptibility to disease than any other genetic group in the world, other than other isolates like Polynesian Islanders or Native New Zealanders, which is why the CDC and the Indian Health Services work really long and hard to make sure everybody gets their inoculations, because they are much more likely to die than anybody else. Uh, COVID is a good example of why we actually it's our benefit here in Oklahoma because after the tribes had inoculated their tribal members, they started distributing it out of the tribal uh, health services to the counties in their area. I mean, that's what the Choctaws did. That's what the Chickasaws and the Cherokee and the Muscogee and the Apache did that as well. So because they had access, because they were the most susceptible, once they had gotten their people they still had the pipeline, so they started distributing it out to our people, people who are not tribal members. And that's meant that, you know, as opposed to Arkansas, Oklahoma has a slightly better uh, inoculation rate in this particular manifestation. Uh, but it, it's why we have to be real careful. If you're tribal members, you have to watch out because they've only been exposed to these nasty diseases for about 500 years. 
Europeans, Asians, and Africans have 10,000 years of little snippets. Because every time you have a disease, there's a little bit of DNA that gets attached to your, especially white blood cells, so that you are able to go and come up with a possible fighting, a immune response. And so if you've ever had the cold, you may have had a snippet in there that helps you fight COVID. Because COVID is a coronavirus, which is what the common cold is a part of. Not that particular strain, but it's within a strain group, which is why some people, some of the studies may show, because none of them are consistent, every week they come back with something different. But some of the studies indicate that there are some folks who had the disease and never knew it. They had COVID, they have had it, but they never existed had any symptoms at all, and a part of it may be because they had a close enough strain that their antibodies were already working on it and being able to fight the symptomatics of COVID. Other people may not have had it. It's an interesting problem, and we'll probably get another two decades to figure out exactly what was going on, maybe. We still don't know all of what happened in 1917 with the Spanish flu, so we're still trying to figure that out. 